All right, well, I've got 1 p.m. So I'm going to go through, start going through my quick little introduction here and then I will turn things over to our speaker. Uh, but welcome everybody or welcome back to Force 2023. Um, I'm just going to run through these couple housekeeping items and give an introduction and then, like I said, hand things off. Um, so if you've just joined, again, Force 11 membership is free and we hope that if you're not already a member, you will uh, take a look at the website and consider joining, uh, joining Force um, so you can stay in the loop about events like this and participate in our all of the other activities we've got going on. Um, and regarding this conference, you know, it's a huge community effort and I just want to acknowledge and thank all of the volunteers, sponsors, and funders that have made the event possible this year. Um, that's not something that we could put together without them. Um, and then, um, again, this is the second to last session of the conference, but we do have one more panel after this. Um, and I'll share that info at the end of this session. Uh, you can also get that information on the Force SCED page. Um, and then during this session, you know, please be aware of and abide by our you know, code of conduct. And that is also available on the website to review if you need, to, if you need that. Um, I think everybody is seasoned at attending this kind of event by now, but it is there. Um, and then we do have another event coming up um, in a few months, the Force uh, Scholarly Communications Institute, which is an opportunity to you know, attend different courses on the theme this year of um, the global enhancing the global impact of open scholarship. So there's actual courses, there's other events, and there's more information on that again on the Force 11 website. Um, and then I just wanted to take a quick moment to explain myself and my role with the conference and then hand things over. Um, so I'm Lisa Curtin. I've had the pleasure of participating on the Force Conference Planning Committee twice now. Um, for the 21 and then this year's Force 23 conference. Um, both times that was on behalf of ICSTU, the International Council of Scientific and Technical Information. Um, so I've represented them to the Force uh, Conference Committee. Um, I've actually just recently stepped down from my position as executive manager for ICSTU, but uh, I'm happy I'm able to finish out my duties to them and to the conference today by bringing this keynote session. Um, and I wanted to just briefly describe ICSTU and encourage you all to check out that organization as well. Um, it's an international NGO that brings together institutions and organizations. Uh, you can see some examples of our members here. Um, all of these organizations sort of fund research and provide research and scholarly communications infrastructure um, to varying levels of those two things. Um, and ICSI supported the fourth conference for the past few years because um, it shares in that goal of increasing accessibility to and awareness of particularly scientific and technical information for ICSI. Um, and so wants to support innovation and collaboration in that space. Um, so if your organization is one that sort of provides research funding or infrastructure or works directly with or in support of organizations that do that, you know, I encourage you to look into XD a little bit further. Um, it's a really diverse group and it provides opportunities for exchange between um, organizations and people that I don't necessarily see in a lot of other membership groups in this space. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about that, just my quick acknowledgement of you know how I've come to force and um, with that I just want to turn things over to our speaker I'm really pleased to introduce the fourth and final keynote for this year's conference uh, Dr. Chaitan Baru. Um, Dr. Baru is currently a senior advisor I'm sorry if I'm, I realize I just didn't ask you how to pronounce your name I'm so sorry but uh, he is a senior advisor with the U.S. National Science Foundation's Technology Innovations and Partnerships Directorate and he supported many other NSF projects at the senior level for the past um, 10 years or so and he also has 25 years of experience um, research experience with the San Diego Supercomputing Center at the University of California San Diego um, and today he'll be sharing more about his work with NSF on the Open Knowledge Network project um, and we'll have time for Q&A following his talk but feel free to post your questions in the chat as they occur to you um, and we'll get to them during the Q&A. Um, and with that I will stop sharing my screen and hand things over to you Dr. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Lisa. I'm now going to share my presentation. <clears throat> so you should be able to see it. Yep, looks um, good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So being the second to last session at the meeting, uh, first, I want to thank you all for lasting it, uh, lasting out this long, uh, surviving to the end. Um, so I'm going to give you a little overview of this effort that is underway right now at the 
uh, supported by the National Science Foundation called the Open Knowledge Network. Uh, I have a few slides. I'm sure I'll take much less than one hour, so there should be plenty of time for um, for Q and A. Um, <clears throat> so the vision for this uh, concept of a knowledge network started uh, a while ago um, at NSF. Um, so it's basically a vision for interconnected uh, network of public data, uh, you know, to power the next generation of AI and so on. And as you'll see from the dates, it even started in 2017. And of course, you all know how uh, this field of AI moves. Uh, I think we heard about chat GPT maybe in, in November of last year, and already the world seems to have completely transformed. Uh, nonetheless, I think this notion of representing information in this way and th at this level and based on real data is absolutely essential and valuable. Um, at the very least, now, now we have the word we all talk about hallucination. At the very least, to stop things like that. But but you know there are many applications that really are driven by this. So the original vision for this was out of a effort that NSF had uh, way back in 2017 called. Ha it was about when data science and big data was just beginning. If you can think back that long ago, uh, it was called harnessing the data revolution. And in that, we put one of the there were many ideas that were put forward. One of which was that we do need to represent. Uh, the information that's carried in data at sort of a knowledge level using concepts like knowledge graphs and the networks that connect all of this together. There was an interagency workshop that produced a report, uh, which actually involved industry. There were people from a lot of different companies there, including IBM, Bosch, uh, also Google. And actually, since then, Guha at Google has started building something called the Google Data Commons, which is also based on this notion of uh, creating Know, using things like RDF and schema.org to represent the data so that we can do much more uh, useful things directly with the data. Uh, so that was uh, in 2018. Um, in 2019, NSF uh, created a new program called the Convergence Accelerator, which I, I was also affiliated with, which operates in tracks. Each year, tracks are at, uh, basically advertised, defined by NSF, which are really technical uh, topics on which projects are invited. And the very first track was on the open knowledge network, creating uh, these kind of knowledge graph structures out of data um, going forward. And I'll say a little bit more about that in the uh, subsequent slides. Going forward in March 2021, there was uh, something called the National Security Council on AI in the US that put out a report. Um, in which it explicitly said that you know a knowledge network uh, that connects public data is an essential component uh, of AI uh, for the future. Uh, there was a special issue of the AI magazine that had a bunch of articles that actually covered a lot of the projects in the convergence accelerator from before. Uh, and then in uh, 2022, we ran a so-called innovation sprint to discuss and talk about, uh, to have a community discussion about what does it mean to build a prototype of such a network uh, that went from February to June of 22, produced the report in September, and these are all resources available online. Uh, and finally, and the thing I'm going to talk to you more about today is uh, just in Mar no, last month, March, we announced a, a solicitation in the US uh, for building the prototype uh, open knowledge network, uh, which is proposals are due uh, in June, uh, June 20th. Um, so talking a little bit in terms of what was uh, what has been the what we call program activity, in other words, what have been the things that were actually funded along the way, um, at least by NSF, uh, I mentioned the con Convergence Accelerator Track A, which started in 2019. The way that program, I won't go into the details of the program, but just very quick, the way it works is there's a phase one uh, of those where, in this case, we funded 21 phase one projects, which received funding for about a year to basically work out their team, work out the details of what they're going to do, um, get their partnerships going, ensure that they've identified the right customers for what they're trying to do. It's really about accelerating, accelerating research into uh, practice. So it's like a translational research activity as we call it. And from those phase ones, we select uh, phase two uh, projects. So phase ones are allowed to apply for a phase two. We funded five which went for two years, they actually received $5 million for two years, which is quite a lot of funds um, because the idea is to get things done. You know, uh, In some sense, the budget should not be the limiting factor here. 
because we want people to start implementing and, and uh, building prototypes. Um, so the funds, the projects we funded in that phase two are, are listed here. Once again, you can do sort of Google searches and find their websites. They each of them have a website and have presence on the web with papers and so on. One was called the Nowhere Graph, uh, which is about uh, recording spatial information. And that's uh, Christoph Janovich at UC Santa Barbara who leads that. Another one called Scales, which is actually about judicial court records for the first time court records were being actually represented through knowledge graphs and they had to work on some very core basic ontologies to record judicial events and so on. And that's uh, led by Louis Amaral at Northwestern University. Uh, Spoke is the scalable precision medicine open knowledge engine. Uh, uh, Self-explanatory is basically biomedical databases. I think they put together 40 different biomedical databases with the goal of actually using it all in medical practice uh, eventually but also maybe for things like drug discovery and so on. Um, Sergio Baranzini at UC San Francisco leads that. Uh, the urban flooding network is about capturing flooding events in, in urban areas. Uh, and Lilith the Yagyasarian at uh, University of Cincinnati leads that. And the last one is more uh, on building tools and pro uh, sort of building a set of tools and pro sort of programming environments to make it easier to build these uh, kind of knowledge uh, graph and knowledge networks, a lot of common active, uh, 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 procedures that have to be done to convert the data into graphs. And that's uh, led by Mike uh, Caffarella, who's uh, now at uh, MIT. Um, as I mentioned, the second step after that was this innovation sprint that we ran, which was a fully volunteer effort. Uh, this was not something NSF funded actually, but we kind of organized it. Uh, it was joint actually between NSF and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, who are very interested in these kinds of sort of public infrastructures to uh, facilitate AI and, and data access. Uh, and the basic idea of that sprint was that this whole thing really needs to be driven by use cases. So if you're familiar with things like knowledge graphs, it, it's not just about you know, uh, whipping out a bunch of technology and putting a whole bunch of data together, it has to be in some context. You know, who's going to use it? How are they going to use it? And that does influence how you design the system and what you do with it. Uh, so use cases was an important part. And as I mentioned, we are now here uh, with the solicitation, which will be the next sort of funding uh, vehicle to move this forward. Uh, the current uh, effort is a multi-agency effort in the US. So it's uh, led out of NSF, but involves NASA, National Institutes of Health, uh, National Institute of Justice, uh, NOAA, and the US uh, Geologic Survey. Uh, several other agencies are also interested in, and are listed in the solicitation. They, we didn't have enough time to sort of go through all the things needed to put them in the front, on the front sheet, so to speak. But it's uh, DARPA, uh, Department of Transportation, the US Army Research Labs, and VA's the Veterans Affairs. So a lot of government, federal government interest uh, in using these technologies and basically unleashing the power of the data that they all carry. And as you may know, federal government has tons of data. And this is just to give you a sense of, uh, you can imagine from February to June was a quite a bit of activity. We had over 200 people engaged in the whole thing. So there was a lot of different things were discussed. Quite a broad range of issues that were touched upon as part of the innovation sprint. Everything from you know, governance, how does such an environment get governed, who gets to say what, uh, who gets to do what, uh, the ethical issues, uh, even though we call it open knowledge network, we're not necessarily talking about all data being open. Very quickly, when you get into serious applications, especially with some of the government data, you can get into sensitive data and data that may not be openly accessible, which is fine. In that case, really what we mean by open here is an open systems approach, that we are all doing things in a similar way so that if two agencies want to connect, it's much easier for them uh, rather than each time being a special lift. So there are ethics issues there. Provenance came up as a very big thing people want to know in these environments. Again, it's not like large language models where you may not have a clue where this uh, thing came from. But here people are very interested to know no, what is the origin of this data? Why do you say this? Why is this the answer? Where did you get the data from? Now, of course, scalability, like I said, we want this to be uh, not just some kind of a bespoke system created for one app. It should be 
scalable to many different use cases. Uh, it should be done in a way that it's sustainable. And for for that, I think our in our way of thinking, connecting with federal agencies helps because NSF is simply a research funding agency. We are not an agency that keeps things going in the long term in the sense that we don't have mission to do that. But there are many mission agencies in the government that have to do that. So that's one way to do sustainability. Uh, worrying about access rights, you know, who's got access to what and who's got access to do what. Uh, data validation, how do you, even, even if the data is coming from a federal government source, as you know, a lot of data can be quite dirty. Uh, how do we validate it? How do we make sure we're getting the right thing? So these are kind of the issues that were discussed. Um, there's also a discussion that the architecture, technical architecture should be sort of agnostic to the use cases. And that there are, there are more than one way of thinking about how to implement these strategies, uh, more than one way to do governance, uh, of course, many different aspects of ethics and so on. So that one slide just gives you this breadth of all that was discussed. I'm not going to go into the details of each of those. Uh, if you look at the report, there's extensive discussion about each of these topics. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the use cases were really the foundation of that discussion. And that's very important to us is to be driven by the use cases. And there were 18 different groups that got formed. And by the way, this was bottom up. Uh, we didn't form them. We, we had a first meeting where there were about 200 people. And we just asked the people there, what kind of applications are you interested in? And then people started clustering based on the interest that they expressed. So uh, we just categorized the 18 into sort of broad categories. There was one set of use cases that's about equity, social care, uh, social care and justice issues. Uh, one broadly on uh, climate change, which you know, sort of includes disasters and energy systems because they're all sort of tied together there. One on health communications and information accuracy in that domain. Uh, one on just understanding uh, the innovation and research ecosystem, right? So all these funding agencies have lots of proposal data and proposal information or award information in all the proposals that they have funded and putting it all together to understand who's doing what, where are things going. So that's the innovation ecosystem. Uh, of course, big issues like supply chain, uh, how do you use all of this in decision support? Can you use this for financial risk analysis? So those are, each of those is a, obviously a huge issue, but there was a discussion about what can we do in those uh, areas. And then there was a bunch of use cases that what we would think of as horizontal. In other words, they cut across all of the use cases, doesn't matter what, the use cases, obviously, the technical architecture would be one of those. Uh, and there were a few other issues uh, discussed, standards, and so on. And the last one was about, uh, well, and one of them was about education, how, what kind of education and training materials should be developed. And that's also a um, horizontal effort. And it's very important for us to keep in mind throughout that this is, we are not talking about just a technical effort, right? Uh, those are important. You can get engineers who can get together and suck in maybe petabytes of data and create these kind of things at massive scale, uh, very important and can be very effective. But the kind of effort we are talking about is a lot more to do with users and use cases, understanding what they need and building a system that sort of serves their need as you go along. And that is much more of what I would call a socio-technical effort. Uh, bringing the right people to the table, understanding all the different stakeholders who are involved uh, not just the data owners, but the uh, actually even the bosses who uh, who might have to you know assign budget to this or assign people, uh, the end users who actually want to use it, uh, maybe the technical, maybe the data curators who are actually curating it, and then and then also the technical folks. So it's it's a effort that involves a, a lot of different parties. So coming back to our specific solicit solicitation that's out there now, so you can understand it that solicitation now in the context of everything we have done uh, so far that I've, that I've, that I've explained. Um, we put it out uh, asking for proposals in one of three themes. So when you submit, you have to say, which theme are you uh, addressing or is your uh, proposal area going to be in? Basically, theme one is the use cases. So in theme one, you're focusing on creating knowledge graph structures. Uh, it has to be in collaboration with federal agencies. So that's one thing about this solicitation is we are looking for real engagement with federal agencies uh, because, like I said before, they have a lot of data that they want to unleash and uh, make usable. 
uh, and they can pro provide you the use cases. They can connect you. You know, federal agencies themselves have their own users. Could be citizens, could be businesses, could be other federal agencies. But they can tell you how their data is being used. So they're very good at giving you use cases. So one set of one theme is uh, pursuing those use cases and creating the necessary uh, knowledge graph structures to enable those use cases. Uh, the second theme, of course, emerges from the horizontal that we just mentioned, and it's really about what you might call the fabric. Um, while all those theme ones are working on their use cases, we don't want them to go off in completely wildly different approaches for how to implement these things. At the end of the day, we want all, the, all of this to be a network that can connect with each other. So the job of theme two projects is to think about what does that mean architecturally, right? What would be the system architecture? What are the standards? Uh, how would we do this? Uh, maybe they have to think about what kind of on-ramps would we have to create? Uh, even though we want everyone to be uh, able to be connected, there may still be differences. We are not saying everyone has to do exactly the same thing, but the differences should be such that a technical group like a theme two group can look at them and say, okay, here's no, how we know how to connect these two things. So that's the kind of work that they should do. And another important thing that we identified, as I mentioned before, was education and outreach. And interestingly, it's at all levels, everything from the ordinary citizen, because if you're trying to put this out as a public facility, you want to be able to explain why are you doing this, right? Why is, uh, let's say, government investing their resources in creating such a facility? How does this help the end user, the, the, the citizen? But there's everything all the way from the citizen to... Um, you know, like I said before, the people who are uh, owners of some of these resources, the maybe the bosses in the federal agencies, they have to understand why are they putting, why are their people saying we should put money into this, um, and uh, and actually the technical developers themselves. Um, actually, it turns out that some of the knowledge graph related technologies may not be widely uh, known. So, if you're talking about uh, Sparkle or or property graphs or you know whatever graph databases. Um, you, some, even if you're a programmer and somebody who knows technical work, you might need to have some guidance about, okay, how do I go about doing this? So, so all the way from the citizen to you know, deeply technical materials have to be developed. So that's theme three. And as you can imagine, all the one thing that's uh, uh, different about this solicitation is um, all of these projects actually have to talk to each other. So it's like a cohort of projects that we would be funding uh, they may all go off in the beginning independently because they have to figure out, you know, what they're going to be doing exactly, how their pro uh, project is progressing. But very quickly, team ones have to start talking to team two and vice versa. Team two have to start understanding what are these guys doing? What do we need to be ready for? And they all have to talk to team three because educational materials have to be created uh, that support all of that. Uh, so just to dig a little further into these, uh, and I can go through this pretty quickly, uh, theme one uh, should have um, sh should um, have already identified uh, key public data sets. That's why they should have worked with federal agencies before. So this, you're not receiving money to come and say, okay, now I'm going to think about what data I need. You should already know that. Uh, data should come from typically more than one source because we're not talking about projects which are just taking one database and enabling it. The whole idea here is to deal with the sort of networking aspect. Maybe you have to uh, define um, you know, border ontologies uh, that connect things together. You have to worry about how to articulate uh, between two different data sets and those kinds of issues. Um, when they're in the proposal, they should be very clear about how they're going to do it. So part of this is not Again, saying, well, once I get started, I'll, I'll figure this out. You should have a pretty good idea how you're going to do it. Because that's the idea of prototyping. Because even when you have a pretty good idea, when you actually start doing it, there are going to be some issues. And that's what we want to deal with. And uh, not that you're brand, thinking about the ideas as part of uh, the project itself. Uh, similarly, end users and uh, data providers should already been, have been identified. Uh, so that when you get started, immediately they're there. Uh, and then they should be um, <clears throat> connecting with the other uh, themes, as I said. Uh, theme two, uh, as I mentioned, would be a little more technically oriented uh, effort. Uh, they should be more worried about things like, am I building something that's scalable, that's generalizable? Can I support multiple different projects? Um, 
and they have to do demonstrations uh, at scale and, and they should be talking as we said uh, with the team once uh, so in some sense the kind of things that these projects need to be able to uh, demonstrate is that a they have the technical skill or, uh, one they have the technical skill to do the job the technical job but the second is that they have the uh, uh, both the ability and the interest to support others doing their job. So in some sense, you can think of this as a user support or a user service uh, facility because they have to work in collaboration. They can't just say, okay, I built this thing, it's really cool, now it's your job to go figure it out, right? They have to actually be willing to help. Uh, so they have to have that sort of open and collaborative approach because um, sometimes even they may learn from the theme one, let's say. They might not have thought about some issue and a particular theme one might say, oh, actually we need a system that can do X, Y, Z and they should be willing to say, oh yeah, we, we, we'll look into how to fit that rather than saying, no, this is the model and you should make it work here. So again, hopefully you get a sense of the kind of things we are looking for. And I already mentioned theme three, we are looking for education and training uh, materials uh, to basically impart the message to a variety of uh, stakeholders. Um, and I think that's probably enough to say there. Okay. Uh, the project is driven by deliverables. We actually plan to have a kickoff meeting where we bring everybody together in the beginning so they all meet each other and understand that they're going to be working as a cohort. Uh, basically, there's a one-year um, deliverable of an alpha version of whatever it is you're doing. But before the one year, somewhere along the way, I think in six months, you have to say what your alpha would be. And the NSF uh, we, and our partner agencies, we'll all work together and, and look at the what they are saying and give them feedback and say, okay, yeah, that looks good. Now go do it. Uh, similarly, at the end of second year, you get uh, a beta of whatever you're doing. And somewhere up front, you should also be very clear about what you think your alpha and beta are going to be. They can evolve as you go, of course. And then uh, before the end of the project, so before the 36 months, these are all three-year efforts, uh, in the 30th month, you should then have your deployment of the prototype, which that six months allows for, you know, maybe there's some slippage or you want to do more cool things after you've deployed it and so on. So once again, the notion is it's a, it's a there is a schedule and we have to meet these schedules. And these are going to be projects where we might even decide to stop funding a, a project if it's not meeting the schedules. Uh, so as I say, we have a kickoff meeting, we have quarterly meetings to monitor uh, what's going on, and then kickoff meetings uh, each year. Uh, these are all three-year uh, efforts. So that's uh, really uh, all I had to say. Um, there is a couple, uh, there's a couple of, um, yeah, you know, maybe I can say that, you know, the fact that we had that uh, innovation sprint and all the agencies and the community that got involved, there's a lot of excitement around this, which is obviously why we went forward and uh, even created this program. And I think it's, it's, the moment is there. People are very interested in understanding. They realize that, you know, just saying, okay, my data is here, it's open is not enough. You have to do go to the next step, make it more accessible. And doing it through these kinds of structures is, is one way to do it. And I, I would argue that all the recent stuff that's happened with large language models and all that only makes this even more critical that we have real data, actual data, which has to be validated and provenanced and all of that, of course, but that you actually have systems that serve you real data rather than some hallucination of what you think the data is. Um, and so a couple of, uh, in that vein, there have been a lot of events and like you all invited me here, uh, thank you for that. I've been going around, you know, talking about it only, be, and, and actually this meeting I'm attending to, is in between another meeting going on today uh, by something called the uh, BIRDI, which is the Bo Board on Research and Data Infrastructure, which is a National Academy's board. Uh, and actually, they're talking all about the FAIR, okay? And, and clearly, this is part of FAIR, you know, findable, accessible, et cetera. So a couple of events coming up. Uh, there's a Knowledge Graph Day where there'll be another presentation on OKN there, uh, which is part of the ACM Web Conference, and that's on April 30th in Austin. Uh, and then we are running an OKN workshop. So there you'll hear uh, more details of some of the projects I mentioned uh, today, as well as... Um, 
This is the Knowledge Graph Conference, if you're familiar with it. It's a very uh, interesting venue because there's a lot of industry presence there. So we'll have several talks from industry um, uh, about what they're doing uh, with knowledge graphs and so on. So it'll be a combination of academic and industry presentations at this workshop, which is on May 9th uh, at Cornell Tech in New York City. Uh, but the workshop itself is actually an online uh, event. Um, so I think with that, uh, it's more than half an hour is available for Q&A if you want to uh, engage in any of that. So I think, Lisa, I'm, I'm done. All right. Well, thank you so much. I, that was really informative. I think, and you know, I think the project is huge and has huge implications. So I'm hoping we've got some good questions here. Um, so folks, if you want to put them in the chat, you know, please put your questions there. Or I think, I don't know if I have to do this or Todd, but you can raise your hand or unmute and ask a question that way. Um, but just uh, something I'm curious about because it's something that's come up in my own work is, you know, what has the experience been so far with bringing so many agencies together? I mean, there's a lot of excitement about this project, but I know every agency has different priorities, different kinds of data. Like what, what have, could you speak a little more maybe about the conversations that have gone into this so far about making this such a collaborative effort between the agencies? Yeah, it's actually a great question. In fact, I just realized one of the slides, which would have, I, I, I didn't mention one thing, which I will now. Um, <clears throat> but it's a great question because I think I would say what we're finding in common across agencies is the really the pressing need to make their data available. Um, not just because, you know, the higher ups are saying it and you know, everything from the White House down, <laughs> if, if not just this administration, it started even in the previous administration, the push for opening data and so on. But I think, uh, you know, this generation of people who are in charge of the data in the federal government or whatever, see that there's tremendous amounts of valuable data that can be used for so many different applications. In the case of government, it's about, um, it's also about providing services to all the citizens, making things easier and you more useful for citizens. And, and, and government folks are, I would say, are really motivated to do things like that. So that's the common fabric because everyone, and, and if you're in the federal government, you, you'll realize what valuable data you have, right? You're sitting on some fantastic data sets, which could be used in so many ways. That That's sort of the common thread. Uh, however, it is true that, uh, you know, different agencies have different amount of budgets for this kind of thing, to be frank, okay? You might you might see an agency that looks very huge, but actually their budget may, for this activity, for digital activity may not be so much. Uh, so one thing I'm, I think we are finding is there are agents, uh, agents, federal agencies that are more sophisticated about these technologies uh, versus those that are less. Everyone is aware, no, nobody's clueless about this. It's just that, they've not had the resources to do it and, and so on. That That's one. Uh, so the, usually the way that reflects is, uh, and I'm sure you all know this, if you're, I'm a computer scientist, I've worked with all sorts of scientists before. If you don't know what a technology can or cannot do, sometimes you come in with either what you might think of as very naive questions. I mean, you might say, wow, that's, you know, that's like really hard to do. <laughs> or you might come in with a question, they, they think, I have this hard problem. And you, as a computer scientist, you say, well, that's very easy to do. That's not a hard problem. So, you know, just finding the level set, which is why, again, engaging with users and use cases is important. So you understand really what do they want and can we pull that off? I won't name which agencies because that wouldn't be fair. Uh, but, you know, different agencies have different sophistication. Having said that, one of the agencies that is very sophisticated about this is NIH, uh, National Institutes of Health. Uh, and actually, interestingly, they are part, so most of the agencies, I mean, all the agencies uh, who are partnering with us are really partnering on theme one. They all have, if you look at the solicitation that's online, there's actually text in the solicitation from each agency saying, we are interested in solving this problem. Sometimes the problems are kind of narrow. Sometimes they're pretty big, you know, climate change or something like that. Uh, but that, but basically they're coming in with use cases. NIH is different. NIH is going to be in theme two, which is the common architecture. Because NIH has said, look, we have already funded. What NIH is suffering from is they have funded a lot of knowledge graph efforts across so many different, essentially diseases or so many different parts of the biomedical data space. 
And they really wanted all of these to come together. And they like this idea that we, we could fund a common architecture type group that's beginning to, there'll be some kind of a forcing function to start pulling all of this together. So that's sort of been our experience. And to the point earlier, yeah, I, I'd be happy to make these slides available. <clears throat> you can post them. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we've got some additional questions here. Um, uh, we asked him about if there were any particular offices or institutes within NIH that are specifically working with you all, but I don't know. If, yeah, I guess we've kind of covered that already. Um, well, this other I mean, question. Oh, I, uh, well, let me just say something on that. So again, if you see the names there, there's so Halut uh, Resak is our colleague from NIH, and I think he's in the Office of Data Science Strategy, which is sort of uh, in the sort of so-called front office. This is in the office of the director of NIH. And if you understand NIH, actually NIH is a 27 independent entities, some of which are pretty large, like NCI and so on. Um, however, we've also had direct communication. In fact, next week, one of the next month, one of the talks I'm giving is a knowledge graph meeting that the NIAID, National Institute of Allergy and Disease, um, is kick, is doing, and I'm going to give the kickoff meeting. And the reason I mention it is you know, just to show that you know they're interested, right? <laughs> and they're one of the institutes within NIH. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And then I see there's another question about the ethical considerations. I know you mentioned that that's been a big part of the conversation for the roadmap. Uh, so she was asking uh, if you could expand on the ethical considerations of knowledge networks at this scale. This is obviously operating in a different legislative framework to the EU and the UK, but she's wondering about the risks to data subjects, you know, how those are assessed and managed in or how you've cut, or at least what conversations have been had about that, I think, about bringing yeah, no, together thanks. data from so many sources. Right. Thank, thanks for that, because there was serious conversation on that. Uh, as I said, we had a broad set of folks involved in that sprint, and some of them were from Veterans Administration, um, National, the J J Department of Justice, <clears throat> um, uh, and of course, NIH, and uh, you can imagine Department of Justice, Veterans Administration deal with extremely sensitive data. Um, actually, again, if you look at the solicitation, there are three different uh, ethics frameworks that are explicitly mentioned, and basically it says you should follow things like these or, or similar frameworks. Um, so I'm sure if we get proposals that are talking about criminal justice data, uh, and actually the uh, use case that the National Institute of Justice has put, which is in the solicitation, is related to gun violence. And so it's very sensitive uh, private data. Uh, and we would be expecting those projects to say something about what are the ethical considerations that they're going to um, uh, adhere to and how does that get operationalized in a technical way and so on and so forth. But the reason, but the, I'm saying that because so there was a very, very energetic disc, and, and the reason, by the way, those things are explicitly mentioned is because they actually came up in the innovation sprint, and there was a very energetic discussion throughout. Uh, you know, we had some people, including from VA, who said, "No, the very first thing you should say in any of this kind of effort is ethics. You should start with ethics. You, know, you cannot start with anything else." So it's a very and then they pointed us to, I think it's the VA that has actually a list of rules that you must follow. Now, the distinction, I think, as you implied there is not everybody has that kind of private data. Okay, so NOAA has, you know, different geospatial information. Uh, NASA has, you know, biology in space, you know, Martian biology, all sorts of weird things where there are absolutely no such considerations. There may be other ethical considerations in terms of how are you providing access or are you somehow making, building a technical infrastructure that creates a barrier for certain people to use it. Again, education comes there. Uh, so we have to worry about the full spectrum. Uh, and so I would say that'll be interesting as we go forward. But we absolutely have people and agencies involved here who care a lot about the ethical. And last thing I'll say is I do agree. I mean, I, this whole ethics issue, I'm I'm a computer scientist, but I started looking at it when I was first at NSF five, six years ago as senior advisor for data science. And I always felt that Europe is leading the charge here. 
I think US is just always catching up, which is unfortunate. So I do agree. I think we look to Europe quite a lot. In, even in our discussions, a lot of examples given saying, well, look at what the Europeans are doing, right? So I think I think that's a good thing for us. Uh, they, at least we have somebody to follow. Yeah, there's definitely I think a different level of protections built into some of their laws already that you know we're still yeah. not yet have not yet arrived at in the US. Um, so we've got a question from Todd. Um, to what extent is the adoption of persistent identifiers a core component of the theme two infrastructure effort? Uh, is there work needed in the world of identifiers, metadata, or ontology development that would support this infrastructure? I guess, more, kind of, where have persistent identifiers come into this conversation so far? Yeah, uh, first I'll say yes, Ishwar is absolutely involved. <laughs> so uh, that was an earlier question. So Ishwar is very much part of this. When I was at NSF last time, we had many discussions together. They're all, I would say, fans of this effort. And Halut is basically representing Susan Gregory and Ishwar, uh, Chandramal Ishwar. Um, yeah, uh, to this question, uh, I actually have uh, a meeting with um, the identifier, uh, Bob Khan. <laughs> so Bob Khan is one of the original internet uh, people who has for a long time been talking about uh, identifiers, you know, uh, and the whole architecture for identifiers. So he, he was, he's interested to talk about it. Um, so what, and, and there are other, uh, you know, other uh, activities uh, related to that, right? So what we are planning to do is um, the kickoff meeting that I mentioned we are planning to invite some of these very key external groups to that kickoff meeting because we don't want these projects to work in a vacuum or not knowing what else is out there. Uh, this is really a prototype building activity. Uh, it's not a research activity in, in a typical research project sense where you just go and explore the thing and so on. No, if there is something that's useful and out there that can be used, we want you to use it. So that actually would be one of the tasks of theme two project. Uh, because maybe we don't need, uh, you know, some theme ones might already be worrying, worrying about, okay, what, what are my unique identifiers and so on. Some of them may not even know, that, uh, which would be okay, because we we'll say, okay, team two, it's your task to figure out what's the technical infrastructure for this kind of stuff, and then help these other folks figure out how they can maybe adopt that. Or if a team one says, no, we got our own, Okay, then theme two's job is to figure out how to deal with it, that they, these guys have their own and what does it mean? So yeah, absolutely. We, we want to be completely aware of everything else that's going on. Don't reinvent anything. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think jumping off that question, Violetta has one in the chat and I think you can see it, but I'm reading it for the recording. She said identifiers in the knowledge graph environment will need to be abiding by the W3C standards, um, web IDs and RDF format, right? Um, I guess, right. has that been established? <laughs> or? Yeah. yeah, that's basically what we want to do. And if there's any D, absolutely standards, uh, W3C being one of them. So in case you're familiar with a name like Aura Lasilla, who's one of the original web semantic web people, and he's now a senior uh, engineer at Amazon, uh, Aura was involved in the innovation sprint completely from beginning to end. Um, and uh, once again, so people like that will look at this and say, there's, there's nothing new here. We've, we've talked about this 30, 40 years ago. Yes, so this is not a computer science research project. NSF Sun's funds computer science research. This ain't it, okay? Uh, and we actually, NSF has funded a lot of the work that has led to these kinds of things. Um, uh, but this is about prototyping the reality of taking data and making it happen. Uh, we would like it to be st absolutely standards-based. Um, no, we'll have to see if somebody deviates from a standard, we maybe will say, why are you doing this? But ideally we'll say, no, you can't do that. Um, you have to put it into RDF or whatever that format is, uh, or at least make it look like that so that if somebody else is coming from outside and says, I want to consume this as a standard form, like whatever it is, RDF, they should be able to. And you should not be able to say, no, no, mine is a totally unique thing and you have to write a special piece of code to access mine. That, that would not be allowed. Okay, yeah, that had been sort of a question I had as well, and I think it's really just a theme to 
goal to sort of work towards these standards or establish the standards to make sure that the different graphs theme one creates are inter can be interconnected and interoperable. Um, and that's yeah, absolutely. I mean, like a uh, big undertaking. It's a big undertaking, and you know, we'll only show off what we can. So this is only a you know, in any case, there are always finite amount of money. In this case, we have twenty million dollars, so it's not like a huge amount of money. But you know, twenty million is not peanuts either. Um, but but um, you also mentioned ontology. So one of the horizontal groups was a discussion about ontologies, and, and we we wanted to go we want to go ontology light in the beginning. In other words, you don't want this to be a project that just gets sunk in the ground because of ontology discussions that never end, right? And actually, NIH, uh, they will also agree, have some of those. And actually, they have very successful ontology efforts. And that's why they're saying, well, we've already funded that. We want now to see how to connect all this. But the one uh, group we had that was discussing is actually called the NEEM ontology. So for those of you who are familiar, NEEM is an old acronym. So, so again, people say, well, it's been around for 20 years. Yes. So why should we throw it out, right? I mean, think of it the other way. They're, they're actually going on for a long time thinking about all of this. And they've actually figured out a lot of federal data, how it can interoperate using the ontologies. Now they're also moving it forward to the new, uh, they, don't, they didn't say ontology until now, but now they're moving into this ontology world. So technically they are also trying to keep up uh, and that would be part of it. The other thing I didn't uh, say, so we plan to fund up to two theme two efforts uh, in the beginning, right? In other words, two different groups, uh, because if they're going to explore different aspects of the architecture, in the end, we're going to merge them into one because there aren't two architectures. There's going to be only one architecture, but you might need to explore the space a little bit. And maybe the space is so large that one project can't just do everything. Uh, so this allows us to fund two projects, but they'll be told at the end, we are going to merge. We're, we're going to have a technical advisory group of some sort that's going to say, okay, let's put all of these together and make one track. And that will be, and that will then be continued to be funded as the one effort. Yeah. I think uh, we've exhausted it. <laughs> Lisa, I, you're I on, Lisa, you're on mute. Lisa, you're on mute. Can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I was going to say, or I'm curious what, um, across the themes, like what kind of organizations are you expecting to submit proposals. I know you've said you want potentially industry to be involved, but they may not necessarily be the main lead PI. Um, you know, where are these proposals coming from? Who are you hoping submits to the OKN? That's a very good question. And I have to, so I, I'm at the, I'm in this new directorate at NSF called TIP, as was mentioned, Technology, Innovation and Partnerships. And one of the things we have innovated at NSF you know, two years ago under the Convergence Accelerator is, uh, this is now getting a little technical, so I apologize if you, uh, is issuing something called Broad Agency Announcements, BAAs, uh, and federal government BAAs are the things that industry looks at. They, they don't look at uh, what NSF typically issues, which are called solicitations. So the NSF solicitations are written for universities, and, and industry doesn't look at those. Uh, having said that, uh, and, and the reason we do it in TIP is because a lot of our programs, we want anyone to apply and especially encourage industry to apply. Uh, but we, they all, generally they require it to be multi-sector. So you could be an industry, but you should have an academic partner, partner and so on. In this one, we went uh, in the more traditional way. Um, to be frank, partly because of the time, <laughs> we didn't have time to do the whole thing. Um, however, it's very clear in the solicitation that we want to have, in, in fact, if you read theme two, we very clearly say we would like industry to submit under theme two or somebody who looks like industry, meaning someone who understands what it means to run production systems and is willing to do all that kind of maybe dirty work, not just some computer science research professor who, th who thinks, I have a grad student who could do this. So we're trying to avoid that. But but it will still be coming out as a solicitation. Uh, again, this is getting in the weeds a little bit. The only thing I would say is um, that only means, uh, in general, applying to NSF means that you should be certified 
it's not exactly a certification, but you should be uh, vetted vetted by NSF as a as an organization that's allowed to submit to NSF. That involves a few financial steps. So that's the only caveat. If if you have not gone through those financial steps, that can take a long time, and you may not be ready. But the big companies all can do it. A lot of companies can do it. In fact, to be frank, I received an email yesterday from one of the uh, like a startup company that does exactly this kind of knowledge graph, knowledge network kind of stuff. And they want to submit and they want to talk to us about uh, submitting. So we're we are talking to them. So yeah, it'd be great. We'd, be lo we'd love to see uh, industry proposals in any of the categories. Doesn't matter really. Uh, but it's just come out as a solicitation is the only caveat. All right, thank you. And if you've got another technical question, um... Is a common API framework going to be in place to allow for queries via API and command line interface? Uh, people often think of knowledge graphs in, uh, from a visual perspective, but uh, Eric is curious about how much of a focus there is on data being machine readable and retrievable. Um, is there yeah. a technical document on this subject that would be better I to mean, refer I, to? Not from our side, because once again, we are leveraging existing stuff. So I would point you to W3C standards in semantic web and knowledge graphs. Absolutely, absolutely, they should be machine readable. So it's not just about pretty pictures. It's a graph, but it's a graph that the machine should understand. Um, so our, you know, RDF representations uh, or, or things like that. Uh, the other thing that could happen, I mean, this would be interesting to be frank, you know, we'll see how it goes. But I mentioned to you that NIH is very interested in theme two. Uh, NIH has been running some projects themselves about trying to have knowledge graphs and integrate them. There's a project called the Data Translator that they have done. A and uh, there is something called the Common Data Fund, um, uh, the Common Data Fund Ecosystem, I think, uh, where they have funded a lot of data projects exactly to focus on what does it mean to create data infrastructure. Now, they use something called the Smart API. And you have, you'll have to go Google search and read to see what a smart API is. Um, so, you know, when we meet with them, they may very well say, well, you know, our projects are all using smart API, you know, so how do we do this? Yeah, this, it'll be a technical discussion. Okay, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, if I'm saying W3C standards or some standard on this side, and you already have something there, which has been funded to a you know, very good level, you can't throw out all of that. So we'll have to think about a technical interoperation there, but it all has to be standards. It all has to be machine readable. Okay, okay thank you. Um, and we've got a question from Violetta. Do you see a possibility for industry partners such as one set combined knowledge graph technologies and blockchain to submit proposals? Um, said, for example, Origin Trail, um, which has a Phenomenal track record, according to Violetta. Um, so yeah, I guess, is there room for blockchain knowledge graph companies to submit or put forth proposals? Yes, I hope they do. Um, in fact, in the innovation <laughs> sprint, a uh, couple of the companies that were engaged were doing exactly that, knowledge graph and blockchain. <laughs> they, they, they were in the innovation sprint. So I think the innovation sprint document probably lists all the participants. Uh, but that was definitely... Um, 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 actually, one of the horizontals that I mentioned, so I think we talked about 18 use cases, right? Out of those four were the horizontals. One of them has a strange name. It says something about uh, self-deployable distributed infrastructure or something like that. It's Web 3.0, whatever you want to call it. It is about blockchain and distributed architectures. Great, thank you. Um, let's see if we've got any other questions. Um, you know, Eric or Vila has other comments about Sparkle endpoints, but that's not a question. Um, but I think this has been great. Are there any other questions before we wrap up here? Um, I will let me post my closing message in the chat just for everybody. Um, we have one more panel session today, like I said, so please join us at that. Um, but I think. This was really great to hear more about the Open Knowledge Network. Um, if we have any more closing comments before I... Uh, no, I just want to thank everyone for staying till the bitter end. And uh, if you have any questions, you should feel free to send us, send me email or 
There's also OKN at NSF.gov. You can send email to that. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us today uh, to everybody. And thank you, Chaitan, for presenting to us. Uh, this is really great. And I think a really great project for everybody here to hear about after all the other great talks we've had throughout the conference. Um, you know, I think it can tie in a lot of what so many people here work on. Um, cool. But yeah, everybody, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for your questions. And uh, we'll see you at the final session coming up. Right, thanks, Lisa. Thanks for inviting me. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Take care, all.